Hello everyone, my name is Kyle and this is Web Dev Simplified, where we make the web easy to understand and accessible for everyone. In this video, I'm going to be discussing everything you need to know about CSS Grid. I'm going to start by talking about what CSS Grid is, go into when you should use it, and then finish up with going over all of the syntax for CSS Grid. So let's get started now. The easiest way to get started with CSS Grid is to compare it to what it's most similar to, which is Flexbox. Flexbox, I've already created an entire video on, so if you haven't seen that, make sure you check it out so that you can continue watching this video. So Flexbox essentially is just a way to lay out things in one dimension so that they're flexible and they can change their size dynamically based on the content inside of the Flexbox container. Grid is exactly the same in that it allows you to lay out items flexibly inside of the container, but it allows you to do it not in just one dimension, but in two dimensions. It also allows you to line up items within those dimensions, both vertically and horizontally, just like Flexbox does. And it's essentially Flexbox, but for two dimensions instead of just one dimension. It's incredibly powerful, but difficult to wrap your head around due to the complexity of the layout mechanisms. So we need to talk about a little bit of terminology first before we can continue further. The first thing that I wanna mention is that you have a grid container, just like you do in Flexbox. This container is the object that wraps all of your different grid items. So in this picture, the container is the square that wraps all the different objects inside of this grid. Then inside of that grid container, we have different grid items, which are all these multicolored boxes of different sizes. They're all items inside of the grid. They just have different sizes and take up different positions inside of the grid. We then have the gaps between our items, which are called grid gaps. And then we also have our lines for our grid tracks, which are these dividers that you see between all of our different rows and columns that our grid is composed of. So now that we have that basic terminology out of the way, let's get started with creating our own grid. In here, I have Visual Studio Code open with a project which is some basic background styles and nothing inside of it. Let's open that with Live Server. As you can see, we just have this dark background and we can get started by creating a container to wrap our grid items in. So let's create a div. I'm gonna give it a class here of grid container. And inside of that, we're going to want to put our different grid items. So we'll just create different grid items, give them a class of grid item, and we'll also give them a class of which number they are so we can easily distinguish them. So we have grid item one, let's do grid item two, and grid item three. And if you save that, you see that we now have these different items showing up on our screen so that they're easy for us to visualize. But we have no styles being applied to them other than the visual styles themselves. So to get started and create a grid, we need to open up our styles.css and we need to display grid for our grid container. So we select our grid container and in here, we just put display grid. And if you save that, you'll notice absolutely nothing changes and that's just fine. Grid by itself doesn't define any rows or columns for us to work with. So by default, it just looks exactly the same as normal divs inside of a container. What you need to do to make grid become an actual grid is to, to find specific columns or rows for your grid. So to do this, you'll use grid template, and then you'll say columns if you wanted to find your columns. And in here, you put a list of all the different column sizes you want. You can use percentages, pixels, EMs, REMs, whatever you want to define your sizes. So for example, if we wanted to have a 200 pixel column and a 100 pixel column, if we save that, you see we have a 200 pixel column on the left and a 100 pixel column on the right. And then our grid wraps to the next row where it has another 200 pixel column. So our grid is essentially two columns wide and it has a 200 pixel column and a 100 pixel column. But what if we wanted our columns to flexibly size themselves based on the items inside of them? That's where we use what's called the fraction unit. So instead of a 100 pixel column, let's say we wanted this to be one fraction of our size. And instead of 200 pixels, we wanted this to be two fractions. This works exactly as Flexbox does for flex grow in that the two FR is going to be the same as flex grow of two and one FR will be the same as flex grow of one. So essentially two FR will be twice as much space taken up as one FR. And if you save that, you see that our items on the left here in our first column are twice as large as the items in our second column. And that's because of these FR units that we defined. Another thing that you can do with grid when defining your actual columns is to use a repeat so if we wanted to have, for example, four columns that were all 100 pixels wide, instead of writing out 100 pixels four times, we can just use the simple repeat command. And inside of the repeat, we just put 
how many times we want it to repeat, and we put how large we want that size to be. And if we save that, we now get four 100 pixel wide columns. And if we go in here and add a few extra grid items, you'll see that we have four 100 pixel wide columns, and then this one wraps onto the first column when we get to the fifth item. That's exactly how we want it. We can also do the same thing for our rows. So we can do grid template rows instead of columns. And let's say we want to have a 200 pixel tall row for our first row, and then we want our second row to be 150 pixels tall. If you save that, we now have a 200 pixel row for our first row and 150 for our second row. But if you don't know how large your grid is going to be, so you don't know how many rows it'll be, you can use what's called grid auto rows, and this will determine the size of all rows that get added after our template rows. So for example, we can put in that we want all of our rows to be 150 pixels tall. So if we delete this template rows here and save it, now all of the rows that aren't defined, which in our case, we have no defined rows. So all of our rows will be 150 pixels tall. If we add back in that grid template rows and we make our first row 200 pixels, but we don't define our second row, it'll just default to this auto row of 150. And as you can see, our first row is 200 and our second row is 150. Let's change our columns back here to be 200 pixels and 250 pixels, just so it's easier for us to see. We'll get rid of all these things for our rows and save that. And now we have our nice two column layout. And let's add some content inside of our different grid items to see how they scale with different size content. Inside of our first one here, let's just add a little bit of text. We'll say 50 words here. Instead of our second one, we'll just add 25. And if you save that, you see that this first grid item is much longer than our second grid item, and our second grid item just grows to fill that amount of space, which is exactly what we want. But let's say inside of our styles here, we'll add our grid auto rows back in, and let's say we had defined our rows, we want them to be 150 pixels tall. If you say that, you see that our text just overflows outside of our grid item, which is not what we want. We want our grid item to grow to that size, but be 150 pixels minimum. So we can use what's called min max to define what we want our minimum size to be and our maximum size for our content to be. So we want our minimum row size to be 150 and our maximum to be auto, which means it'll just fill the amount of space it needs to put its content. If you save that, you now see that our first row fills the amount of space it needs to put that content and our other rows are that 150 pixels tall since they have no content to fill the extra space. And that's exactly what we want. Now let's remove that content from here so we can see our view a little bit better. And there we go, we got our rows back, exactly like we want. And now we can talk about spacing our rows and columns apart from each other. We can do this with the grid gap property. So we have the grid row gap, which determines the space between our rows. Let's, for example, put in here 20 pixels. If you say that, we now have 20 pixels between all of our different rows inside of our grid. We have the exact same property for column. So for example, we can put 10 pixels between all of our columns, and you'll see we now have 10 pixels between our columns. And if you want the same value for both the row and column, you can just use the grid gap property, which sets both the column and row gap to be 20 pixels in this case. And now you see we have 20 pixels between all of our different grid items on the rows and columns. And that's, for the most part, all you need to know about sizing your different columns, your different rows, and your gaps. There's only one other way in which you can lay out your columns and rows, and that's using grid template area. Grid template areas allows you to create different strings for the areas that you want your different code to take up. So in our case, let's say we want to have a header and another header. So we want our header to take up the first two rows, just like this. And then we have one of our grid items, let's say grid item one in this case, we can give it a grid area of header. And now if you save that, you see that this template area, our entire first row is going to take up the space of this header. We can even define further rows after that. So let's say we want our next row to be sidebar and then content. And then again, sidebar content. So we can use our grid item two here. We can set this to be a sidebar for the grid area. Let's do the same exact thing for our grid item three, except for we're going to make it the content. And now if we save this, 
you'll see that we have our sidebar on the left side here and our content on the right side here. So these grid template areas allow us to name our different items based on an area and then position it in our rows using the template concept. So we lay the rows, the areas that we want for each row. So for example, column one will be header, column two will also be header. So it'll span both of those columns. Our sidebar will be in column one for both row two and row three and so on. So it'll follow the template columns and rows we have set up and it'll put these objects in the different areas that we've defined. This is great for when you wanna reposition elements on different size screens or shrink or grow elements based on your screen size. But it's not something that I use very often when I'm creating grids because I prefer to style my elements using grid column and grid row on the elements, which we can talk about now. So let's remove these template areas and these areas from our different items. And we can do the exact same thing of spanning across our different columns by using grid column start to determine which column the grid item should start in. So in our case, we want it to start at the very first column. So we'll just put one in here. And then we can use grid column end to determine where we want this grid column to end. And you may think that we want to put two in here because we want it to end in the second column. But the way that the columns work and the rows work in our grid is a bit different. On the right here, you see that we have our very starting column, which is on the far left. This is column one. Our second column is actually this break between column one and column two. So our second line is right here in between grid item two and three. And then column three is actually the line at the very end of our page because each column that we have, each section has a start and an end. So if we started at one and ended at two, we would just be covering up this first section. And if we wanna start at one and go to the end of the line, we'd have to use a column end of three here. If you save that, you see that now we still spam the full header, which is exactly what we want. If we were to change this back to two, like we had mentioned earlier, you see that it only covers this first grid area. Another way to do this is to use negative one, which will span all the way to the very end of the column. And there we go. You see that it goes all the way across the row since negative one corresponds to the farthest away column on the right side of the page. You can even shorten this further by using the grid column property, putting our start at the beginning using a slash and then putting our end at the end here. And if you save that, we get the same exact thing as using grid column start and end separately. We can do the same thing again for our rows. So for grid item two, we'll choose the grid row start. And we wanna start in the second row here, so two. And then we wanna use grid row end. And we wanna end in the fourth row, just like I had mentioned earlier, if we end in the third row, it'll only fill one slot. We want to go to the fourth row so that it'll fill two spots. And we want to do that for both of our grid items here. If we save that, you see that we now get that same layout we created with the template areas. This is incredibly useful for creating layouts that span different sizes of our column. Also, you can use the span property. So if we wanted this to span two columns, and we could just say span two. And if you save that, it'll now take up two column widths. Same thing down here with our grid rows. We could change this be span two, and now it'll just take up two rows. And same thing down here. And there you go, now our properties, our items, are spanning two rows. We could even change this to be span three, for example, and now this grid item three is spanning three rows, or even just span one, which is the default, which means that it's only gonna take up one row space. Same thing with the column. Span one is the default, which means that it just takes up one column and one row by default. So now let's remove all these different grid column layouts here. That way we have our grid back to how we want it to be. And now we can start to talk about how we can align our grid container and our grid items inside of our container. This works very similarly to how Flexbox works for aligning items using align items, justify items. So in our case, there's two types. We have the items and the content version of align and justify. So there's align items and justify items, which is how we lay out the different grid items inside of our container and then there's justify content and align content, which is how we lay out our actual grid container inside of the container that that's inside of. So let me show you an example by justifying our container and aligning our container. So we'll use justify content, which is what is going to contain our container and make it move around. And we'll just say center, for example, if we want our grid to be in the center on the horizontal axis, if you save that, you see that our grid is now in the center. And if we increase that, you see it a little bit easier that it's in the center of our screen 
we could change this to be in the start, for example. And notice how we don't use flex start. That's only for flex blocks. In grid, we just use start or end, for example. And if we wanted to align our grid inside of our screen, we could use align content. And we can say center, for example. And we also need to give our grid a height so it can align itself inside of that. So we'll just say the height should be 100 view height, so it'll take up the full screen. And you now see that our grid is centered vertically and it's right lined for the horizontal. So now we can do all the different types of alignments that we could do in Fluxbox inside of here. So we could do stretch, for example, and it'll stretch our grid to fill the full size. We could do the same thing for justify. We could make it stretch as well, but since our grid items can't actually grow, this won't change anything. We could even do like space around, for example, space our items around like that, and so on for all the different types of justifying of our content that we want to do. Next, we can look at justifying the items inside of our container. So let's remove all of the content justifications we have, save it so we know what we're starting with. And now if we wanted to justify the items inside of our container, we could say that we want our items to be centered inside of their different rows. And as you can see, now the items are perfectly centered inside of their corresponding columns. And if we wanted to center them in the row, we would use align items of center. And this will now center them inside of their different rows, which is perfect. We can also change this to be start, for example and it'll be at the top of the row, end for the bottom of the row, and so on. And we can also do the same thing with justify, for example. And by default, these are both set to stretch, which is why you see that our sizes on our things look like this when we have no justifying of our items. And these properties can be overridden on the different elements inside of our grid. So let's say we wanted to take our first grid item, grid item one, and we wanted this one to be aligned at the top of the row. We could just say align self start. If we say that, you now see that this is aligned at the top of the row and everything else is aligned stretch. We could also override justify. So we could say justify self and we want it to be in the center. And there we go. You now see that it's aligned itself in the center horizontally. And that's how we can override any of the different justify properties or the align properties on the individual grid items and set them on our container using justify items and align items. This whole aligning and justifying of containers and items works almost exactly the same as it does in Flexbox. So again, if you haven't checked out my Flexbox tutorial, make sure you check that out for more in-depth explanations on these justify and align properties. And that's everything you need to know in order to get started creating grids using CSS. It's very similar to how Flexbox works, but it allows you a lot more in the way of laying out your elements due to it being in a 2D nature as opposed to a one-dimensional nature. Fluxbox and Grid were designed so that they would work amazingly together, and using Fluxbox containers inside of your different grid items is one of the best ways to lay out a site in my opinion. And luckily, support for Grid and Fluxbox is nearing almost perfect in all modern browsers, so you can use this on modern sites and not have to worry too much about supporting older browsers unless you're trying to focus on Internet Explorer 11, for example, which does not support Grid fully. I know this was a really quick overview of everything that you can do in Grid, so if you're confused with anything or want further clarifications, just let me know down in the comments below and I'll make sure to get to you with an answer to any of your questions. Thank you guys very much for watching this video, and if you did enjoy it, please make sure to leave me a like and subscribe down below for more tutorials in the future. Thank you guys very much for watching.